All right, so we appreciate you guys coming out this morning. Thanks for everybody that helped. Really good breakfast. Um, we have with us this morning, we have Steve Schultz. He, you, you guys messed me up with that whole Clayton <laughs> Schultz. We yeah, I got a bunch of names in my head. Sorry about that. Clayton Schultz, and I might get this part wrong as well, because I wasn't planning on doing this, so I apologize. But he's a director, is it the Western Institute? West. West Institute, which is, uh, which is uh, in conjunction with the Shepherds Theological Seminary that Doug Bookman, who you guys know, is a part of. And so he's also a pastor, and he's going to come share with us this morning what, whatever's on his heart. And he, uh, he tells a little a little, you can tell us a little bit about your journey getting here. It sounds like you uh, did a little bit of planes, trains, and automobiles yeah, yeah. getting here. So. I didn't ride the back of <laughs> so we appreciate that effort, but you guys give him your attention and give him a hand. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Did, do I need a mic up or do you? Everybody hear me all right? Yeah. All right. If you can't hear me, just let me know. So, uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I'll share a little bit of my story. I got some sleep last night, spent a couple days getting here. I uh, spoke at a campus in Raleigh, North Carolina the night before at NC State and then got about two hours of sleep. Flew from there to San Francisco to catch a flight here. That flight got canceled. Joe told me that later that that's pretty normal, so I won't, I won't be flying to through San Francisco very much anymore. Uh, and then they, the, the latest or the earliest they could get me here would be be today at I think 8 o'clock was at whatever time that last flight comes in and that wasn't going to work so I just had a flying me to uh, Salt Lake City for a little last night at the Joe's house at about 10 o'clock somewhere in that name or, uh, realm so yeah that's how I got here but it's, it's been fun I, I like this uh, part of the world I grew up in born and raised in Cody Wyoming and lived in Billings Montana so kind of in this area family that lives in Driggs Idaho and uh, and Victor, and, and we, they, they live in Jackson Hole, right? But they live in Idaho, so. Uh, yeah, I love this part of the world, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the, what we call the, the West Institute, the West Institute for a couple of reasons. One is it's in the West, uh, and the other end is, is that we wanted to remove the idea of seminary in its classical form from the from the equation and really say what is it you know most of the original movements that that, uh, that I look upon with great favor were Bible Institute movements. Uh, hey, let's learn the scriptures together. Let's let's study God's word and go out and do ministry. And that's basically was was my heart in uh, me and our senior pastor Paul Martin starting what we call the West Institute. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, uh, on the way over here, we were talking about um, this. What would, it like, what would it be like for me to do a devotional for you guys? And so I don't want to spend a ton of time, but I do want to take you to a place in the Old Testament. So if you have your Bibles or your phones or whatever you happen to have, turn to Exodus 15, and I'll kind of introduce that, hopefully in a way that's uh, meaningful to us as men, and uh, where the Lord takes us. And one of the things that I can look back upon in my life, and I, I'm, I'm still young, I'll turn 40 here in a couple of years, and... Uh, I could see most of my growth came actually through difficult circumstances. Uh, Joe and I were having a breakfast this morning and uh, shared with him just you know, how the Lord laid the West Institute on my heart when I was going through seminary to see in the to stark contrast in theological education. What was missing was obedience. A lot of knowledge was being poured in, but you know you can. You can go through seminary, and as long as you can afford it and get good grades, somehow you're not qualified for ministry. And, and what, there was nobody looking into our lives, and I saw it in my own life as well as those that I was going through, just a lack of obedience and, and, and a, a missing of that light, tying our theology to how we're living. And one of the things I was sharing with him is just kind of how the Lord brought that together. And it, clearly, only God could have created the West Institute just through the circumstances around it. One of the things I didn't share with him, which I, the Lord put on my heart as we were driving over here, is the hard place he took me in bringing the West Institute about. So I was going through school, the Lord was laying 
that is on my heart. This is of God. This is what we need. We need a, a, a we don't need another theological training center. We need something with a different end. We don't want to throw out theological training. We want intrusive discipleship to be added to that training. And so uh, this is God. This is this is awesome. This is going to happen. And we we uh, had decided to uh, step down from a, a, a company. We were, I had been working for Canacuck for nine years up to that point. I was a director of one of their camps and. Just felt like now was the time to leave, and God was going to start the West Institute. And so I had been writing on it for some time. I began to write even more about how to form it. And if you remember, back in 2008, things took kind of a strange turn in our economy. And I moved to Laramie during that time. It was 2009 when I actually made the move. Got to Laramie, was excited for the West Institute, didn't have a clue how I was going to start. It was a year and some change where I went with no employment. And things, you know, I had some money in the bank, not much, because I've been going through seminary, but we had a little bit of money. And as, uh, you know, I know in my mind that I'm doing the work of the Lord, but I can't even get a job that pays $9 an hour. I have a family with two kids, and just going, oh, Lord, why? Why can't I get a job? What, what, where am I going to do? I moved, in, moved into the basement of my parents' place who wants to do that, you know, when they're married with a kid. Uh, you want to be independent, you, you know, you want life, you kind of envision life unfolding in a certain way. And so God took me to a very difficult place to show me some things and to teach me some things. And one of the things that I learned during that process is, is to begin, and, and you can ask why questions in a really good godly way. So I don't want to make this split hairs over the kind of question you need to ask. But what I was asking myself during that time often is, why? Why did you do this, Lord? Why, why do I have to go through this? Why me? I thought you called me here to do something, and yet like, what, what I felt you calling me to is not happening. And not only that, my life is very difficult. I'm running out of money. And we got down to where we had like $200 in the bank, and my parents were basically paying for our, our existence to live, and it's, it was really difficult. And then a drunk driver hit my truck and totaled it in front of our house. And there was $7,000 more dollars right there. And it began to dwindle. And I was like, I gotta get a job. I'm applying for all these jobs, economies in, in, in a bad place. Well, God was showing me and he was building things in me that I needed to know and experience and come to, to realize before he would start the West Institute. So he took me to a difficult, through a difficult thing, but then I began to ask the question, what are you doing, Lord? What are you doing in my life? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to build in me? And that made all the difference in the world. And my ability to kind of appraise the situation and give God glory and worship Him, and it led me to Him, not away from Him. So let's turn to Exodus 15 and look at one of these stories from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is such a, such a powerful um, example for us. And if you're, if you're in New Testament, you'll see Paul call it, and he'll say that the Old Testament is an example. These things happen as an example for us. First Corinthians 10 talks about how the Exodus and all these things became, they became our example. And that, that's one of the reasons why God tells Moses to write it down. Not so that Israel can read a newspaper account of what happened at some time in the past. He says, no, learn this. And in learning this, make it part of your life. Because the Old Testament is our, it, it, for Israel was its wisdom it's guidance and in instruction. That's the whole point of the Pentateuch. It was to, to guide Israel. Well, how, how, how is that going to happen if these, these are events that happen to somebody else? Well, they're to learn about who God is, how to approach God. They're to learn who man is and what man needs to do. And so as you're, as you're studying Torah and as you're studying the Old Testament, you've got to understand that these things were written down for the, for the very next generation and the generation after that to learn about who God is and, and then live out of that, okay? So, if you're in Exodus 15, let me just kind of set the stage here. This, the, the, the Red Sea, the crossing of the Red Sea has already happened, and the whole first half of Genesis, or excuse me, Exodus 15 here, is a praise and worship session, praising God for all that he has done in bringing them across the Red Sea. And you would think that that's going to lead to obedience. Right? This sustained, obedient 
uh, character that you're going to see develop in Israel. And Israel's going to trust God more and more as you know, he's brought them to the sea so clearly he can, he's doing something here and he can be the power and the source of their life going forward. So, three days later, three days after the, the Red Sea is where we pick it up in verse 22. I'll just go ahead and read uh, Moses' passage and then we'll just kind of walk through it verse at a time here. It says, Then Moses made Israel to set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days into the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. And there the Lord made for them a statue. A rule. And there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. For I, the Lord, am your healer. And then it closes that section by saying they left there and they went to Elam, and there there was uh, fresh water. So what can we take from this? What wisdom? You know, clearly, we don't want to say the Old Testament was written to us or for us. I mean, these events happened. These were real people, real events, and they occurred. But they were written down for Israel to learn from, to, to gain their understanding from. So what can we do here? Well, the first thing we can do is understand where it says there, the, the, the way they construct this verb in verse 22, it says Moses led Israel there. Uh, it's actually indicating, I think, the truth that's found in verse 17 of chapter... Where is it at? Somebody might, I didn't have this message prepared, by the way, so might have to bear with me. It's in chapter 13 there where it says the Lord is going to lead them. Yeah, and 21, 13, 21, there it is. It says, And the Lord went before them uh, uh, by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire, and he gave them light, and then they would travel as they followed this pillar. And here, the, the verb in 22 is indication of that. They were brought here on purpose. They didn't just stumble here. God in his goodness brought them somewhere where he intended to teach them something. Uh, so God, the goodness and the sovereignty of God is on full display here. And then they find out that their circumstances aren't as they would have wished them to be. And, you know... Their circumstances are real. I don't, we can't throw them under the bus for uh, being in a, in, a, in a desperate place. They're in a desert, no kidding around desert. We go to Israel every year, I do, and the Western Sioux goes every year. And uh, when we are down in the, you know, the southern part of the Negev, not even in a harsh, not even close to what the harshness of the Sinai would be, it's a, it's a dry place, and water is your source of life. And so these circumstances are real. And the, these are difficult circumstances, and they're without water. They will perish if they have no water. It's not the circumstances that I want to focus on. It's what they do about their circumstances. Their circumstances lead to grumbling. And that, that word there, grumbling, is, is better understood as rebellion. They begin to call God's goodness and his sovereignty into question. And that's the key thing that you see throughout the, the Exodus narrative. Anytime they're brought to a difficult place, they begin to question God's goodness. Much the same as I was uh, when I was planning out the West Institute, because I knew this was of God. And then I began to doubt the goodness of God in the difficulty of my circumstances. And I'm certain uh, there's enough age disparity here that everyone in this room has been alive long enough to have encountered a place like this in life, probably numerous times. And I encourage you younger guys to get to know these older guys and learn from the wisdom that God, is, God has been doing this in your guys' lives for quite some time. And so how do we, if, if you're quite aware of how God works, how do you lead and disciple others to see that? I think you're going to take them to this passage. And those of you that are younger in life, I'd encourage you to uh, live this out. Because God will bring circumstances into your life, difficult ones, because he loves you. Not to watch you suffer, but he's going to do it because he cares about you. And that's why he's doing it here. Uh, because he cares about Israel. So they, they find themselves in this difficult situation. The contrast here, I think what Moses is trying to get you to see is what happens 
with the people and what happens with the godly leader. The people grumble. They begin to openly rebel against God. It leads to grumbling, murmuring. What does Moses do? He says he cries out to the Lord for wisdom, right? He cries out to God. He's, and it, and it says the Lord shows him this tree. He takes the tree and he places it in the water. And the water becomes drinkable. And sometimes we, if you read the commentaries or you're listening to people teach on this, they, they get hung up on, okay, what was this tree? Is this repeatable? I don't, think the, I don't think the story has anything to do with the tree. God makes this, he just split the Red Sea. And it could have been a rock that he threw in the water. And so they're, they're, sometimes they'll say, they'll try to identify the properties that this tree should have possessed in order to throw it into bitter water and make it drink pot. To me, I don't think that's the point of this message. And that's why God had to record it. God is saying, okay, you've cried out to me. I'm going to tell you what to do. This is what he's trying to get them to learn. Okay? And then, he's, then he, gives, he, says, he says to them, you know, if you diligently seek me, listen to my voice. This is the rule. This is the statue. Seek me. And that's what he gives them in Torah. This principle of seek God. And he will see you through the difficult circumstance. He may not change your difficult circumstance, but he'll see you through your difficult circumstance. And that's what he's going to do here. So they're going to have water that they can drink. But where I want to take you quickly here, and this is, um, I mean, we could spend a lot of time talking about the, the individual words and all the things here where uh, there, there's more to this story than where I'm going, but I don't, we don't have time to, to cover that and to connect back into the West Institute. But if you, if you look at this last part, it's uh, when you begin to study it out, it's profound. And to me, as I was studying the Old Testament, I have the joy of teaching the Old Testament every year. I had taught this passage a couple of times and hadn't done a, a super deep study of some of these words. When I got to this in my probably third year of teaching through the, the scriptures, teaching through the Old Testament, it brought tears to my eyes because it answered some of my questions. It began to answer some of my questions of, of the, what are you doing, God? And what would you have me to do? When it, when it says here that uh, it's in verse 26, 27, he's saying, I will put none of the diseases on you and at the very that I put on the Egyptians. At the very end there it says, for I am the Lord, your healer. And if you are reading the narrative and you're reading the story, the way in which it's constructed, the logical conclusion should be I, the Lord, am the healer of your water. Okay? That's the way it should, the narrative should flow. Jehovah Jireh. Have you ever heard that? That's what's called, that's the name that's, a, that's coming out there. But what's interesting is that's not who it's pointing to. It's pointing to them. The, the, the verb is actually tied to the people, not the water, which is interesting. He so here's where I go with this. He took them to this very difficult place. Their circumstances were difficult to teach them something, to heal them, to show them something about him. If they would diligently seek him, they would find life. And that's why it says, I, the Lord, am your healer. And to me, that's profound. That, to me, makes navigating difficult circumstances and life a whole lot easier when we understand what God is doing in our lives often. And I've encountered, and I, and I know that I'm going to encounter more difficult circumstances in my life. I've encountered some, some kind of gut-wrenching things that if I had to go through, God has brought me to some difficult places. But in all those things, I can see where he is refining my character where he is eliminating things in my life that need to be eliminated. And these difficult circumstances are not in my life because he doesn't love me. They're in my life because he loves me. And if we can understand that ourselves, if we can disciple others to understand that, it's a beautiful thing. Now, I want to take you to a place where, you know, it's, you guys have been exposed to Dr. Uh, Bookman, right? Everybody's kind of familiar with Dr. Bookman? <coughs> He's my favorite New Testament professor. Because when we're in the New Testament, I spend, we spend more time in the Old Testament. And he's always showing you that the Old Testament is leading and informing the New Testament. It's not this isolated document. 
And I think what you have in the New Testament often is just a restatement of what's going on in the Old Testament. So turn to, turn to James, one of my favorite books. All right, so James chapter 1 says this. You guys, are, you're super familiar. Yeah, most of you probably have James 1 2 memorized. Count it all joy or consider it all joy. Brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Now, often if you're listening to a message or you're reading a commentary, it ends there. But, and verse 5 is often set off as a separate topic. But it's, I don't think it is. I don't think it, the, the way it's constructed in the Greek, it's a separate topic. I think it's highly connected to what's above it. Uh, it says in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, not doubting, not being tossed to and fro. What's the wisdom? Often when you hear, you hear this passage taught on, it's as if the word wisdom w was a blank line in the scriptures. Underline and an insert. You know, if, you, if you need something, ask God and he will give it to you. That's often, often how it's taught. It's not what it's saying. It's saying if, you, if you lack wisdom, what would the lack of wisdom be connected to? The trial, right? That's what it's connected to. He's saying, and he's saying, count it all joy. Consider it joy when you face trials, when you face difficulty in life. Why? Because God is doing something. And if you lack the wisdom to, to see that and understand it, pray to God and he will give it to you. And later on in the book, he's going to tell those that are lacking wisdom or those that are spiritually, um, I, don't want to, I don't want you to take this word the wrong way, but those that are spiritually depressed or those that are uh, in a difficult spot, spot in life, in their faith, he tells them, if you're spiritually weary, seek out the elders to pray for you. That's where he's going to take that conclusion. So even if they've done that and they, they're still, there's kind of a churning in their soul and they're unable to <coughs> see the wisdom, then that's even beyond that, the elder will, will intercede uh, with them in that. So I don't think James is, where am I going with this? I don't think James's New Testament theology is new to the New Testament. This is a principle that's been in Israel in our history. And even the interesting part there that count it all joy is actually in kind of a past tense. It's in this aorist tense. Not specifically past tense, but it's, it's a reflection back onto. Think about what God has done. James, with his, his Jewish cultural background, I think, I think he has the Old Testament in mind. I actually would say, I can't say definitively, it's not in the scriptures, but I think he's thinking of Exodus 15. I think he's thinking of the Exodus account in general. That God took them to very difficult places to teach them things. Now some of those, we, we find, some of those learned the lesson. Many did not. Israel remained hard-hearted often. As can we. We can be hard-hearted believers who begin to question God's goodness. We can become callous and we can begin to lose and, and lose our grip often on the goodness of God, which brings a tremendous amount of anxiety, brings hopelessness at times. And so, as men, I'd encourage you guys to, if, the, if, the, if this is something that, that you have a firm grip on, I praise God for that. And I would, I would ask you to disciple younger men to understand that. Those of you that are younger, I'd encourage you to, to walk with older men who can tell you some of the places that God has taken them and what they learned in that. I needed to learn that the West Institute would not be built on me. I've been doing it for a long time. My identity was highly wrapped up in it. And this would have been something that I created. But I can, I, I can, my soul can rest in what I'm doing. He can move me out of the West Institute Tell someone else to continue that on. And I, I, with confidence, know that my identity will no longer be tied to it. Clearly, it wasn't something I brought about. But God used me and many other people to bring something about. 
and I needed to learn those lessons. And it, I, he, he brought me to those places because he loved me. So I'd encourage you guys to make that a, a, something that, that is significant in your life. You know, because we all encounter difficult things. All of us. It's, I think it's one of the chief ways. I, use, I call this the way of the Father. I think it's one of the chief ways God actually refines us. He takes us to difficult places. Because what, what gets exposed wouldn't have been exposed otherwise. We desire comfort. We desire ease in this life. And this leads to so much hopelessness. In our, in our cultural understanding of Christianity, we've painted this, God loves you, he wants to be your best friend, he wants to lavish you with things. Well, not all of that doctrine is bad. It's good. He does love us. He cares. He lavishes his grace upon us. But not often how we think of that. When I look back on my, those difficult circumstances where I barely feed my family, he was lavishing grace on me. Because he, he, he didn't want me to stay where I was at. He wanted me to grow and become more like his son. And I needed those lessons in my life. And I'm confident there's going to be more lessons to come. So, let me transition. I pray that we can, we can take that with us. That's kind of, in a nutshell, what the Lord has laid on our heart as we have kind of formulated what the this thing that we call the West Institute is all about. We want our students to get and receive a really good theological education, but we want to marry that to their life. One of the things that I notice in my life, and I see it at seminaries all the time, is there becomes this pretty profound gap between what we know and profess about God and how we're actually living. And most of our students that enter in, especially the younger students, uh, they're, they're 90, this is made up of but it's really close to being accurate. 98% of our male students have entered in addicted to pornography. Uh, probably 70% of our students, male and female, have come into our program and, and they experience tremendous amount of anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis, tremendous amount of hopelessness. Yet those same people could write a paper on the sovereignty and goodness of God and ace that and get an A on it. And those two realities should not go together. If God is all sovereign and all good, I should be at peace and rest, no matter my circumstances, right? And so in, in creating that and, and looking at what we just walked through in the Old Testament here, the reason we have theology is so that we would go to God rightly, that we would find life in Him. Not, and, and Pastor Joe and I were talking about this a lot this morning. We often try to find life in all the wrong ways in our doctor uh, as a source of pride. And, and so the kind of the genesis of our school is what does it look like for us to do something different? Not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So our program is a one-year intensive program. Uh, and it's, in all honesty, I think it, it, it fits so many different categories right out of college. You've got probably the best opportunity to set aside a year of your life and come to us. We've had over half of our students have been married with kids, which was a head scratcher for me. I was trying to figure out why are all these families coming in. I thought this program seems kind of rigorous. Like they can't, you know, you you got to provide for your family. How are you going to check out a life, not have a job, just do school? God has brought lots of families with lots of kids, and I think it. In one year, they can do what would have taken them four years. And through family, through them raising support, they can go through and do that. And then now we're starting to see second career people come. Instead of going to seminary for four years, now to say, I want to take this second part of my life, and I want to devote it to the Lord. So it's a 42-hour master's degree, fully accredited. Even if you don't have a bachelor's degree, you can come through our program. Get a transcript. And uh, if you have no training, you'll get the same education, same classes. It's not a certificate program. I really appreciate what Shepherds has done. They created a diploma program. It's a, it's a full transcript, everything. It, it's, uh, it holds weight. Uh, if you meet certain qualifications and you don't have a bachelor's, but you have uh, a lot of training, you received, uh, wh whether that's an associate's degree or we've had electricians come through because they have so much 
so many recorded uh, classroom hours, things like that, and they're at a season in their life where they have children. That, to go back to school and get a bachelor's degree is out of the question. They can actually get a master's degree. So we have lots of ways in which we want to train and equip, and, I, and we didn't even see this. This is where God is, you know, he does more than we could ever ask. Uh, you know, it was created kind of for a, a kind of a single college student, male, female coming out. But now we're seeing lots of family members come through. We're seeing second career people come through. And I, I'll, I'll say this, it, it's, all, it's all of our calling to know God. And it's not, what, it's not reserved for just a select few of us to know it and disseminate it. That's all of our calling. No matter your age, no matter your background, no matter your academic abilities. And so I would challenge all of you, no matter your age, what would it look like to set aside a year of your life to know God's word, that his word might become the source of your life and lead you to obedience, lead you in repentance, that you would spend the rest of your life training and equipping, discipling, teaching. doesn't mean that you'd be a senior pastor. Pouring into men, leading your home well. So I'd ask you to think about that. The way we're doing school is totally different, not just so we can be different. We only do one class at a time. My favorite classes were always in the, the middle of summer when you took a two-week class. You had no other classes. You're not writing you know, four papers at the same time, taking four exams, doing all that. I, I couldn't pull all those things in, in tension. It's hard for me. So let's just do one class at a time. So we're in class for two weeks. Take two weeks off. Two weeks. Sometimes it's a week, and then we do three weeks. So we'll do Old Testament. Oh, actually, the first class we do is how to study the Bible. It's a ba just English Bible. How do you study the Bible? Knowing so we can say, this is what God is saying. And then we do Old Testament 1, Old Testament 2. Then, uh, then we do historical theology. How, how did we get to where we are today? Why, why aren't we meeting in the Catholic Church? And then we, then we go to Israel. All of our students go to Israel, Dr. Bookman, which should be a plea in and of itself to get there before he's no longer going to Israel. Because then you'll have to come with me and it won't be near as good. <laughs> Guaranteed. Uh, and then we do New Testament. And then we go through the systematic theologies, and that's your year. And it's, it's a wonderful year. We meet with our students. We do a lot of intrusive discipleship. We gather together weekly for three hours at my house. My wife meets with the females, the spouses, and I meet with the males, the husbands. Sometimes this, we'll have female students go through. I, I really value both couples getting an education and both couples spending the rest of their life uh, shepherding and, uh, and the, the wife leading young women, discipling them, growing that next generation of women up. Not everyone does that, which is fine, but uh, what would that look like to, to come out and do that? Uh, that? Those two weeks off, sometimes three weeks, sometimes just a week, depending on our class schedule, but the, the norm is two weeks. Take that time off. Uh, it's, it's available to all. It's not, it's not a requirement of any. We do a lot of outdoor activities. Uh, we have a, a gear room. We've got everything from whitewater rafts to backpacks, sleeping bags, to ice climbing equipment. Uh, we do a lot of different things. We live in Wyoming. And there's not a lot of things to do. You guys live in Idaho. If you don't do things in the outdoors, I don't know why you wouldn't, but you know, it's kind of like, what else are we gonna do in Laramie, right? <laughs> so, uh, and that, that what, what, the reason we do it is it builds community. I like to take people to do things they've never done because it usually exposes sin, it exposes fears, it exposes, puts them in an uncomfortable environment. You gotta love people in a, in a, when their soul is kinda you know, being churned up, take them on a 30 mile backpack trip, they've never done anything like that in their life, and you can see how well they love people in a stressful environment. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we do it, but yeah, if you have any questions, I have a ton of information on it. I have some stickers, I've got brochures, uh, or if you just have a question about something else, I'd love to get to know you guys. I'm going to be here through uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, so I've just been here. This is my first time here, first time getting to, to meet Pastor Joe. We kind of have uh, this background connection with Dr. Bookman and, and just kind of where his schooling has been, so I feel like, feel like I've been here before a little bit. Um, but yeah, I'd love to get to know you guys. I'm looking forward to being here, being uh, part of your church service, and just... Uh, 
being a part of the body for the next couple of days. I'm gonna watch Boise probably roll over Wyoming tonight pretty easily. So, uh, can, we, can we do some questions now? I, yeah, by all means. Yeah. This is the first time we've met too, so I've been looking forward to getting to know you. And, and we're, we're, I know Joe's excited. I'm really excited. These guys aren't very far away, which is really cool for us. Um, and so it's a neat challenge, you know. I mean, I went back to seminary when I was, what, 44. And, um, you know, the, the, your, your devotional was cool. I, I called my dad crying one day halfway through seminary. And he goes, you know, it's part of seminary. This actually isn't very encouraging to get you guys to go back. But dad said, yeah, it's kind of part of seminary is that struggle. And, and I, you know, I think in a lot of ways he's right, you know, that God just kind of holds your head under the water for a while to teach you and grow you. And, and uh, that was certainly our experience going, going through. I, I, when your car got hit, was that, did you mean you took that 7,000 and lived on it for a while? Yeah, until it was gone. Too. Yeah, we yeah. totally did that. Our car got hit like three times, and every time we got a little bit more money, it was, it was like, yeah. <laughs> we got rear-ended on the way to Dr. Barrick's class. He wasn't very happy I was late. I don't think you ever even knew my car got totaled that day, but that was, we got like 8,000, I think, for that, lived off that for a few months. It's, it's um, yeah, God has a sense of humor. But I, I had a, I, I want to leave a little time for questions if you guys have any. Are there opportunities for anything other than coming and, and partaking in that full year? There is, there is. There's one opportunity, and I don't know how conducive it is. I mean, I, we make it fully available. Uh, it's called the Bible Institute. One of the things I realized going through seminary is even though you have all these good Old Testament survey classes, you're not in the text all the time. You're not going verse by verse through every book of the Bible. You're kind of left to do that on your own. And when I was down in Texas, I went to Pastor Tommy Nelson's Young Guns program. Anybody ever heard of Tommy Nelson? Pastor down, in, down south, um, Denton Bible Church. He has this program, discipleship program. One, and how he does it is he... You meet together, 6 in the morning, 8 in the morning, you go through the whole Bible, first by verse. But you actually pick New Testament or Old Testament. And I was going, I was like, man, this is the first time I've, I've read through it several times. It's the first time I've gone through verse by verse and understood what's going on. Because there's someone leading me through it, someone helped me understand how to do it. And I said, we've got to make this a part of the West Institute. It's not part of the degree, it's not part of any of that. We, we offer what's called the Bible Institute. And it's, it's only for the faithful. 6 in the morning to 7.45, Monday through Friday, nine months out of the year. And uh, we get together, and we make our way verse by verse to the Bible. And there's a couple of books we don't go through. I usually lead with a proverb or a psalm, try to connect to where we are in the Old Testament. And then we pretty much cover the Old Testament. We don't do First and Second Chronicles, but we do go through Kings. And then as I'm teaching through, I'll teach where there's discrepancy between the two. And then when we get to the Gospels, I'll teach through Luke and harmonize the Gospels as we go through. So any, any story that's not in Luke, we'll bring in at that time. Uh, but we don't go individually, verse by verse, through the other three Gospel accounts, just Luke. And then when we get to Acts, we'll teach all the books as they come in the book of Acts. So it takes us a long time to get through Acts uh, as we're making our way through the New Testament. And what we do with that is we stream that on Zoom. It's, a, it's, like, an, it's like Skype. And so we make that available. The cost uh, of that program is $1,000, so it's $250 a quarter. But we always say this, money will never be a, an issue getting into that program. If you can give a dollar towards it, then we'll give you, you know, a $999 scholarship. Uh, if it's $20, then that'll be it. If you can af afford that, and it, uh, basically that fee helps go, help offset the, some of the costs in running that. And we make that available to whomever. We have about seven people each morning that join us in, from Skype. We have one in Texas, Louisville. Uh, and we have to work through some technical difficulties sometimes. Sometimes the audio is not very clear. Uh, sometimes the recording did get started. But for the most part, you'll be, it, it'd be as if you were in the room with us. You can ask questions. Uh, you can email me questions. And it's just a good way to go through the Bible. We start that uh, Labor Day and run through the end of your normal college Schedule. We probably would be very close to following Boise State's schedule. We run our schedule off of the University of Wyoming. So the only day we teach that they're not in class is Labor Day. We celebrate Labor Day by working. So 
Um, that is one thing that you could get involved. You could always take a class if we're offering it, and you, based on which class and which professor, you might be able to zoom into that. You could just audit the class. You could take it for credit if you wanted to. There's ways in which you can do some things from here. So there is some distance. There is. Possibilities. There is. There is. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, guys? Well, we've got them up here on the hot seat. Obviously, the year's pretty short, right? Um, like, how do you deal with languages for, because I mean, I, I imagine you're, you're trying to dive in deep, and so how do you deal with that challenge? We, we don't teach the biblical languages in our degree. Um, ba basically, that's the difference between our degree and the MDiv. You can go on and get the MDiv, and the cool thing about coming to Laramie first is the students that want to go on and get the MDiv and even know that going into it, they've just cut a year. They, they did what takes two to three years in one year. And so all they would have left is the biblical languages and then about, usually if they're going to specialize in Old Testament or New Testament, one or two additional courses in that, and then an additional preaching course and they're done with their MDiv. So they can knock out the MDiv in, in three years. And it's feasible, it's doable. 100% uh, of our degree is transferable to Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Most any other school will take our whole entire degree because it's so core. Old Testament one, Old Testament two, systematics. And we're not highly specialized in some of these courses that would not transfer to another institution. Um, so if you know you wanna go on and you wanna, uh, be preaching from God's word on a regular basis, I encourage you to learn uh, Greek and Hebrew. I think it, it's uh, super valuable. Uh, there is a way for our students to stay in Laramie and actually finish their MDiv now. They can do that as well in a, in a second year. And we're starting to do some of that online now with Shepherds. So our degree actually comes from Shepherds Theological Seminary. The West Institute is a teaching site that, that's a joint effort between Laramie Valley Chapel and Shepherds Theological Seminary. We call it the West Institute. So how many years is Shepherd's uh, program? Shepherd's has been around a long time. Or no, I shouldn't say a long time. Dallas has been around a long time. Shepherd's has been around for a good amount of time. Uh, they started at, out of kind of like an institute effort. And, and, and it's it out of Colonial Baptist Church. If you ever heard Wisdom of the Heart or Pastor Stephen Davey, that's the president. He's the yeah, senior he pastor. Yeah, how long is the Bible program? Right. So, is it so, a year or three or four year program at Oh, yeah, they have... It's kind of short, almost one year to me. Yeah, they don't have... A, they, theirs is a just standard, like, come take classes. If it takes you five years, take you five years. They have, they have a master's, uh, master's of Arts in Christian ministry, uh, in biblical literature. They also do the MDiv. They have a women's MDiv program. They have a variety, kind of your standard seminary offerings. And then they just offer courses that you sign up for. So that would just go at your pace. However, you know, some people would move there. We, our students get done in a year, and like, I think it was two years ago, one of their students graduated, and it was his 11th year, so it took him a while to get through. The standard uh, for an MDiv is five years on average, sometimes six, if you averaged out the, the, the amount of time it takes you to get through. Most of your MA, uh, you know, theological studies or, or Christian ministry degrees are going to take you three to four years. They, you, they can be done in two, but usually life slows you down a little bit. So. so the idea really of summer is to kind of a starting place, right? Or it's an idea for people who are already in the workforce to really get a good Bible. Yeah, I, I you Bible know. One year seems short to me in one sense. In one sense, it's not. It's really great. Who has time, you know, when they're working full time to sure. maybe, you can maybe take a year out. So I can see where it fits. I'm not trying to be negative one sense. Yep. I can see where it fits. You can take one year out. Yep. Some people. just be a starter. I mean, I went yep. to Bible school, too. We went through every book, every book of the Bible in two years, and you still see the past, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so that's what I was trying to balance. And see, it's great that hey, somebody can take a, a year out of their life, and yeah, and and uh, when do you get a chance to take a year out of your life, two years out? I never trade the years I had to take out of my life to go do that. But uh, it seems like it could be just a starter, right? It can be, yeah, or absolutely. For somebody who's in the workforce who just wants to understand the Bible better, I can see that. But absolutely, it seems yeah. like one year is kind of. It is, but uh, the way in which we're doing it, it's, it's so different. Uh, if, if, you, I mean, if you went to state school, I think you can understand, but seminary is even more difficult, I think, because you're, you're you know, when I was at Dallas, I was in Old Testament 1, New Testament 1. Uh, my first systematic was systematic 3 or 4, had them out of order. 
you're taking classes based on when you can sign up for them, and then you're writing these papers, which are all kind of due on top of each other, and you're reading. And others, most of my classes required three books, so I'd be reading around 12 different books. And it's just, pedagogically, I don't think it's very good how they teach it. Right. And, and so you've got to like try to balance all that, where we're just doing one class at a time, from eight in the, or nine in the morning to 1.15, or if it's a one-week class, it's nine in the morning until four. So you're it's the, a lot. It's the yeah. same. It's the same in class time because we're accredited, so we can't like short circuit it and say, well, we're only going to make students stay in class for twenty hours. It's, a four credit hour class has to meet for, or a three credit hour class has to have forty hours of in class time. But it, it, we can get so much more done. Like when our professors come out to teach one of our classes, you, you know, most of your seminary classes, you have fifteen minutes. Of, before you actually get going in class, and then they'll do prayer requests, and then they'll get going. And when our professors come out, usually they're done with all their material that they normally teach in a 16-week model a day or two early, just because we're, we're going. And it's, and it's quick. And I don't think that material feels like I didn't learn anything because it went so fast. Because you're learning one topic at a time. Rather than multiple topics, you're being tested over information that's fresh. Uh, at most, it's two weeks old. Your final exam is covering information that was two weeks old, and, so it, and you're going to the Bible Institute in the morning. So it seems to, our, our students academically do really well when we compare them to students in Cary. Uh, so we're really pleased with the program. It's a lot, 42 hours. Most people would never dream of doing that in a year. Okay, so you're doing it now too. Yeah, so it's two weeks on. It, 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 sometimes it's a week, but there's a break in between all of it. We're not, we're not just grinding it out every day, you know, like get back in class. <laughs> And then you're like, ah, this is too much. You know, it's there's breaks in there. We take four weeks off in the middle of the school year, and we go to Israel. And then there's usually two or three weeks off when we get back from Israel, of both the Bible Institute and and, and the, the master's program. And then we take two to three weeks off in spring break as well. We get a lot done, but we're really try to be efficient with our time. And most of our students aren't like, I didn't get anything out of that. Our students do do very well in that. But there's 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 a, kind of like a multiple offerings there with Shepherds, with our partnership with Shepherds. If you, if you want to learn at a different pace, you can you know, take classes from here at Shepherds online. So. Yeah, I, think that, I think it's an exciting, I think it's a, it makes a lot of sense. My first semester I had five classes, and the yeah. second day I had a quiz in Greek with 180 questions on it. Yeah. That was a quiz, and it's like, you're reading 500 pages a night for five different classes, I mean, all together. Yeah, it was really hard for me. It's like, no, you're kind of, you know, I mean, I don't read that fast. Yeah. So, I think that's cool. How many, how many students do you have? Average? Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I would say our average class, depending on how many, um, depending on the year this year, we have 13 in our class. Next year, our class size is looking around 15 to 20. So pretty and much that's everybody. About it. That's, that's kind of our idea. We don't want, our desire is not to grow to 300. Uh, students or anything like that. We want to be sure. invasive. Yeah, at a certain point, you're going to lose the intrusive discipleship aspect. Uh, and then our heart, our heart study groups are those groups we, where we meet every Monday for three hours, um, we, which means we share a meal together, we do some praise and worship, and then about two and a half hours of that is actually going through curriculum and saying, okay, this is, this is teaching God's goodness and His sovereignty, so why do we have fear? And we're trying to bring and shrink that gap between what do we know and profess about God, or you know, why is your marriage have this in it? Now let's get up, let's uh, attack that and, and take that into light of who God is. And then outside of that, we need one on one, an hour a week with each student in one on one mentorship, discipleship. And so it's invasive. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm glad it's like that. We want students to go, man, this is invasive, uh, because we don't want people growing comfortable with that gap. Between what they know and profess about God and how they're actually living. So you bring in profs. How many guys are on campus? Myself and Pastor Martin, and then the rest of the profs will fly in, or will zoom in, and then Dr. Pettigrew, if anybody's ever heard of him, yeah. he uh, he's anti-technology, so some of his classes are recorded, and he's going to come out to Laramie and teach it. So his only his classes are on DVD, uh, but it's different because even when we do a recorded class of his, all of our students are together, like all 13 of us in the room will hear his lecture and then I'll get up and interject and moderate. It's not as if they're at home watching it, disconnected from the group. It's still a good learning environment. Um, but his classes are going to, they're actually, 
he's stepping down as dean provost and I'm only going to do teaching, so he'll come, be able to come to Laramie now and teach his classes. His load is changing. Awesome. Good. Any other questions? Else? Doesn't have to be about the West Institute. Talk football, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, does anybody kneel? I was not following. He oh. said, "Talk football." I said, "Does anybody kneel at Agri School?" Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They'll stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we haven't had any kneelers. No kneelers. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming, and I just encourage you guys. You know, if there's something that you know you want more information on, um, if not, you know, keep it in mind. We're you know, as you see people that are maybe looking for this type of experience, we definitely would like you to consider there's other places to go, as you know, but. Um, I think this would definitely be on the short list of uh, places that you want to take a look at. And um, so let's 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 pray for pray for them, and then you guys can hang around. He has information. Uh, feel free to Absolutely. talk to him afterwards. Heavenly Father, we thank you for for Clayton. Thank you for uh, the effort that he made to get here today to come share with us. And uh, we just want to uh, lift up this uh, this West Institute. Uh, uh, fruit that uh, we see coming out of there. We just give you the credit for God. Uh, we just pray that you'll continue to sustain them, to bring the right students. God, I just pray if there are people here that would benefit from this, that would uh, have a desire to, uh, to uh, learn more so that they could serve you uh, more, more fully, that, uh, that that connection would be made and they, they would be able to uh, find a way to, to take that time and that effort to go and, and to study and to, uh, to learn things that, um, that you could use in their lives to bear fruit for your kingdom. And so we just, uh, we just pray that you'll uh, continue to uh, uh, just uh, support and, and send uh, the, the finances and the energy and the people that would uh, make this institute exactly what you want it to be. I pray that, that, uh, that you would protect them from anybody that would come and, and want to uh, insert any any falseness or anything that uh, would be less than what you want them to be doing, God, that you would just protect them from that. And so give a, Clayton, uh, I hope he has a, just a refreshing weekend, and uh, just uh, pray that he'll have a safe journey back home, and we just look forward to uh, uh, partnering together in prayer and, and in whatever other way that uh, that you would lead us into God with them and are excited to uh, see what you're going to do in the future through their efforts. And so just thank you for this morning, uh, for this fellowship, for these men. I just pray that we continue to encourage one another uh, into uh, to good works, Lord. In that precious name we pray, amen. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. I didn't know what time this was supposed to end. There is no, yeah. That's perfect. You and it. It's supposed to end at 10.22. Oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>